behind uh, which could foresee the future. So this is my presentation. It's going to be a short presentation. And um, um, especially for those maybe who uh, uh, do not know MOX or uh, who di di didn't have the possibility of following what we did in the past uh, uh, 20 years. So this is uh, from uh, the official presentation back in 2002 that I, I gave to the Department of Mathematics at that time. And this is that slide, indeed, you see 2002. And we had a logo which was not yet the final one, right? So you see that this was still in the, in the process of uh, transition. So the idea was to, um, or the goal was to create and consolidate a center in the field of mathematical modeling, scientific computing, in science and engineering. We are pretty much aware of the fact that we are at Politecnico di Milano. We wanted to increase the visibility, we call it visibility at that time, of the part of mathematics. Today we call it outreach, maybe. Uh, cooperation, uh, creating cooperation with external partners on funded research projects. Of course, we needed to secure money in order to be able to, to grow and uh, strengthen the cooperation between pure and applied mathematics within the Department of Mathematics. And this is my mantra. I believe that there is just one mathematics, and that the more you know uh, about pure math, fundamental math, the more you are able to devise smart models and, uh, and better and more efficient scientific co co computing algorithms. Uh, so these were, from, uh, these were the basic, basic, say, this was the basic vision. Now, uh, let me see uh, very quickly how we, we did uh, achieve these goals. Today, uh, this is the current status of uh, the relationship, I mean the scientific relationship, scientific cooperations, scientific projects uh, that we have uh, between uh, the math department and uh, uh, the other departments at Politecnico di Milano. Um, this is the, 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 the picture as of today. So I can perhaps say that uh, we are the most exposed and the most interactive and collaborative department uh, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in the, in the Politecnico di Milano. We are the node that is uh, uh, better connected with uh, the other nodes in, in the graph of uh, the scientific cooperation at Politecnico. And again, this is not trivial because uh, Julia was remembering before uh, when, when he came to Politecnico, I can tell you that when I came to Politecnico, this was 1986, long ago, um, uh, uh, my very first day, I, uh, it happened that I met with a famous professor, very esteemed professor uh, from another department. And uh, he knew me, he knew me by, say, by research. And uh, I still remember his word. He said, okay, this is great, but uh, do you think there will be other people interested in Polytechnic on your own research? And this was not a very welcome, see, very warm welcome. So today we're happy to say that uh, this challenge has been... Uh, uh, has been achieved. Uh, this is what MOX is doing uh, for the, uh, say, um, non-academic environment. So those are uh, projects with the industry, with the European Union, uh, which, are, uh, uh, um, which have been uh, concluded. And in these 20 years, uh, we were been able to have more than 100 external partners, m meaning that we had at least 100 funded projects. But in fact, there are many more. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, a good EU support, which uh, we uh, consider to be a very good sign for, uh, uh, say, excellence of research. And these are the uh, projects that are ongoing under the, uh, mm, say, sponsorship or uh, the funding uh, from, from EU. Um, and those are the projects that are supported by the Italian government. By the, ministry, the, by the Ministry of uh, University and Research or by the government itself. So um, we uh, have been able to secure, uh, I would say, at the Italian scale, a reasonable funding, uh, as you see here. So roughly speaking, the average is between 1 and 1.5 uh, um, million per year, uh, which, uh, uh, well, by considering the fact that we are a department of mathematics uh, uh, in Italy, uh, is, uh, I, I believe this is a, this, this, good, those are good figures. Um, uh, these pictures summarize the, um, say, our footprint in different fields. Uh, our publications are for about one third, 35% in mathematics journal, for 18% in engineering journals, 12% in computer science journal, uh, physics and astronomy, 8%, biochemistry, genetics, uh, life, sciences, life sciences, 4%, decision sciences, 4%, medicine, 4%. And, uh, and you see, uh, uh, we 
think that we have been able to create research that uh, uh, has an impact on uh, other fields as well. Um, so back to 2002, these are the, uh, say, Magic 8. Uh, the eight people who were there since the very beginning, and some of them uh, you, you know, right? Um, and now we've been, uh, we've been growing. And this is a picture that was taken 10 years ago in, on the occasion of the 10th uh, 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 anniversary of, of MOX. And uh, uh, so this picture was taken at the sixth floor, which is the place where most of the uh, Moxians are, say. And at that time, we were able to take this picture uh, in and cast everybody there. And today, it would have been more difficult. So that's why we needed to go outdoor. And, uh, and this is 2022, just uh, say in front of uh, the famous Trifoglio, which is the uh, uh, nearby building here. Um, uh, so we, uh, we have been growing. Uh, uh, we've been growing uh, uh, thanks to uh, two uh, drivers. One is that, as I already mentioned this, uh, the um, Politecnico di Milano and the Mathematics Department uh, has constantly invested in us uh, and creating uh, uh, positions that are permanent positions. So we have, uh, as, as you can see, uh, uh, the, the yellow curve is that of the uh, uh, faculty, so now we are about 30. Uh, we have uh, uh, 20 postdocs and, and 40 PhD students. And those are mostly on soft money, money coming from, uh, from external, external sources. And again, this is something which is very unique, at least in Italy. Um, uh, we, uh, we are proud that uh, we uh, received many awards, and those are uh, those of the last five years. You see, they come from uh, uh, Europe, uh, they come from uh, the, in Italy, and from other prestigious institutions. And, um, and now a few words about mathematics. Um, uh, this, again, is one of my slides uh, uh, from uh, my presentation in uh, 2012, so 10 years ago. And this is the way I, I saw at that time the past and the future. So it's very easy to predict the past. It's a bit more difficult to predict the future. And uh, this is what I, I mean, this was basically the, the idea or the vision uh, in 2012, uh, uh, we you see in terms of mathematical methods, methods, we moved from direct simulation to optimization and control, and the idea was to move more and more toward inverse problem identification on, 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 say, addressing the uncertainty and reducing the complexity, uh, which I believe uh, is what basically we did. So this, uh, say, uh, forecast has, at uh, some extent, substantially um, confirmed by, by what happened. So what is next? Well, even more difficult because of the fact that in a few months I will no longer be part of the story here. Uh, but let's say this is my very personal, uh, my, my, my very personal uh, uh, view. And I will do it passing through one example. Uh, and this is my current ERC project. Uh, which is called IART, funded by uh, an ERC advanced grant. And uh, I, I wanted to recover one of the uh, statements that I wrote in the introduction. And, uh, you know, uh, Professor Bourguignon, uh, now I hope that he will not uh, be too severe with me, but when you write such a project, you have somehow to express a vision. And when you express a vision, you exaggerate inevitably, right? Uh, you have to say that uh, you are more good than what you have been experiencing in the past. So this was my vision. In particular, this is uh, see one of the statements. IART will provide a unique, unprecedented research environment for exploring the art with an immensely powerful and non-invasive mathematical microscope. It will realize in Europe uh, an overarching computational mathematical endeavor featuring simulation capability comparable with that of the UT Heart Simulator. The UT Heart Simulator at that time was the most complete heart solver developed so far from the group of Professor Aizada at Tokyo University, but which be furthermore anchored to a rigorous mathematical foundation, a sound and comprehensive data analysis and highly accurate numerical simulations. So this was the dream, say, and well, let me say that perhaps we did better. Today, we are much better than uh, the, the UT Heart Simulator. Um, and uh, I'd like to give you just very few pictures showing, on, say, our recent, uh, recent achievements. Um, uh, this is the heart, but in fact, this is a reconstructed heart uh, from imaging, and uh, what you see here are the fibers of the heart, 
of a specific person, say. The fibers are very important because they conduct the electrical signal and uh, they allow the heart to deform and to express distortion, which is at the very basis of our life, every second of our life. And uh, uh, paradoxically, uh, since we talk about data analysis and the interplay between data and modeling, uh, paradoxically here we are, we are using mathematical models to find data which are not available. So uh, today, uh, by clinical images, you cannot reconstruct the fibers of the heart of a, of a person. You have very preliminary information and you need or at least you can use mathematical models to reconstruct this information that is missing, to reconstruct data. Which is a bit strange, right? Because data typically are the, uh, say, the fuel of mathematical models. You need the fuel, otherwise your car will never move. And here you need mathematical models to provide the fuel. Um, uh, this is uh, a very recent uh, simulation. Uh, we are very proud of that. Uh, this is, of course, uh, due to the uh, uh, say the work of the IR uh, people, and uh, this is uh, a beating guard, as you see. Uh, these are the active tension, which is the forces that uh, are originated at every single cardiomyocyte. And uh, 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 this is not only qualitative; this is the result of a mathematical model and numerical simulation. So it's quali qualitative and quantitative. And this is something that is not available on Atlas on mathemat on uh, medical Atlas. This is not available for images. So this is really a mathematical atlas, which is uh, dynamics and uh, which is quantitative. And I believe that this uh, set a new paradigm in, uh, in, in medicine. Uh, this is the fluid dynamics looking within the heart. What's happening when you get blood coming from the venous uh, system and uh, it, uh, it is uh, uh, brought to the uh, right part of the heart, uh, which is the right ventricle, and then sent through the pulmonary artery to the uh, lungs to be oxygenated, and then it returns through four uh, uh, arterial, uh, uh, sorry, uh, venous uh, um, um, pulmonary veins uh, to the uh, left part of the heart, uh, to the upper part, which is the atrium, and then through the um, um, one, of the four, one of the four valves, uh, which is the mitral valve, it enters into the ventricle, the, the left ventricle, and then uh, when uh, uh, the pressure is so high that uh, the resistance of the uh, aortic uh, valve is, uh, is uh, uh, won, then uh, the blood will enter the main aorta, and, and, and through the main aorta and through all the other vessels will reach all the cells of our body. Um, so these are two examples. And I'd like to give you an idea of the cost. Uh, if you're a mathematician, you typically never find the word cost in your uh, books, right? What is cost? It's something a bit uh, vulgar, right? You don't talk about cost. You talk about theorems. You talk about uh, uh, intellectual achievements. But there is a cost behind that, apart from the intellectual cost. And the cost, I mean, of course, uh, the, the, the investment from the different researchers. So uh, to simulate a single heartbeat, which is one second of real life, um, with uh, using uh, models with order of 20, 20 million degrees of freedom, 20 million of no unknowns. This is a fully coupled model. Everything is nonlinear. Everything is fully coupled with a very fast dynamics. Uh, well, you see, it takes uh, on, a, on, a, on a supercomputer with almost 20 cores, just to give an idea, um, it, it takes a lot of time indeed. It takes uh, 48 hours for a single second in real life, right? But this is not the end of the story. Um, uh, it costs 2,000 euros. You have to use supercomputers, so you need money to, to use it. And this for a single shot, you see, for a single second. So you better have good algorithms, otherwise you are really wasting money. Um, it consumes under a kilowatt hour of energy because computers are not green. We believe that mathematics is green, but it's not. It produces 35 kilograms of CO2. So why am I addressing these figures? Because we believe, I believe, that we need to develop better models, better mathematical models, more efficient and accurate numerical methods in order to be able to face those challenges, to reduce the impact. We need a better mathematics for a sustainable world. Uh, and we need to operate at very different levels. First of all, uh, uh, in the background, you have to work on your model. You have to work on your basic math, right? You have to learn more to use less, to learn more about the physics, to learn more about the, the quality of uh, the mathematical models to see where you, where you could cut, where you can simplify, where you can reduce. So reducing in mathematics is extremely important here. Uh, 
because uh, you never be able to excite a, a, a clinician telling him or her that you need uh, uh, 48 hours for, uh, you see, for a single second simulation. So we need to operate at the very basic of the mathematical understanding, and, and, and you need to increase to enhance your mathematical understanding. I mean, it's not just a matter of simplification by dropping terms here and there. You need to understand what you're dropping, right? And then we need perhaps to uh, take advantage of uh, the new paradigms uh, that are emerging, the quantum computing and the, and the green computing. I say nothing about quantum computing because, well, because you know very little. Uh, but green computing, uh, this is uh, a challenge, right? Uh, uh, we need to uh, use a different metric. Uh, today, uh, we, we talk about time to solution, but perhaps we have to uh, change our, uh, uh, our, our view and uh, to, 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 to talk about energy to solution. So how much energy do I need uh, to, to get a solution, to get a mathematical solution? So you have to choose the most efficient machine for a given algorithm. Not obvious, right? In general, uh, uh, algorithms uh, are general purpose because they can run on virtually any kind of machine. Of course, they may have different type of performances, but, but now we have to start thinking that the hardware is cost very little and, uh, and uh, the, 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 the consumption is very high if you do not have the right gun or the right algorithm, say. Right. Uh, you have to take into account not just CPU performances, but also memory use and storage. So storage is, uh, is wasting a lot of money. It's wasting a lot of, sorry, a lot of energy. It's wasting a lot of energy. So you have to start by paying more attention to pictures like those, right? Where you see how you take the, the one on the left. Uh, you change the precondition, you change the iterative solver to solve, say, gigantic nonlinear algebraic equations, and you see the dramatic change in terms of time, power, and energy. Or looking at this, you see the performance on the axis, on the y-axis, you have the average power, right? Not the CPU time, the average power that is consumed. And, uh, and if, if you, uh, in the different phases of your uh, implementation of your algorithm, you see actually that uh, your system is reacted very differently, right? It's smiling uh, when uh, uh, you are consuming uh, uh, little and uh, is suffering when uh, your algorithm is not really very well adapted to that specific machine. So this is a change of mind. And uh, let me tell you that uh, this uh, is not just a matter of application. I mean, when the vector computers and the supercomputers uh, came into the scene in the, in the 80s, uh, 1980s, uh, there's been a, a flourishing of new algorithms, pretty new algorithms, uh, to take advantage of vector computers and parallel computers. And most of those algorithms uh, were grounded on a new mathematical perspective on the, on the PDEs, on the, on, the, on the problem, right? The most, probably one of the most uh, efficient algorithms to solve linear systems in a parallel environment is the Schwartz method. And the Lorenz Schwartz, uh, you see, he, he, he developed this method in uh, his, uh, his idea in 1863. There were no computers at that time. And uh, his, his, uh, his goal was just to, to prove that you can use Fourier series to prove existence of a solution for the Laplace equation in a domain which is not a square or a, or a circle. But it's a combination or it's more general, right? So that was a smart mathematical idea that, of course, was just aimed at producing a theorem. But more than 100 years later, that idea was rediscovered and, of course, we adjusted and improved in order to create one of the most efficient algorithms that uh, everybody uses today. And, and not, of course, not only mathematicians. Um, uh, we need to uh, reconsider the, uh, the basic of science. Uh, uh, well, we have three pillars in the 20th century. We know we have the theory, the experiments, and the simulation. The theory since the antiquity, the experiment since uh, Galileo and Newton, say, and the simulation since von Neumann, since, since the 40s, right? Um, well, today we have a fourth pillar, which is big data. Big data that are generated by satellites, by social networks, by uh, the medtech industry. You see here the diffusion tensor, MRI for a brain. So we have many data, and uh, indeed, uh, uh, say the progression of generating data is, uh, is frightening. Uh, in the average, uh, in the past four years, say, uh, uh, every other year, uh, we more than double the knowledge of data that we have. So we more than double the, what the previous history has been accumulating, which is incredible, right? So how can we take advantage of that? How can we take advantage of this fourth pillar? Well, uh, we, one possibility is the one of 
trying to take advantage of uh, the synergy between physics-based models and, uh, and data-driven models. And uh, already we have many different types of uh, potential cooperation, right? as you see here. So we use physics-based models to uh, uh, regularize uh, the cost function that it is used to uh, find the most appropriate neural network to avoid overfitting. Uh, or when you have data scarcity, it happens, especially in, uh, in the medical applications. Uh, we need data, but data are provided by patients. And you need a cohort of patients, a virtual cohort, which is very broad, and you cannot pretend these patients coming and providing their, say, being available for MRI or, or, or computer tomography just because mathematicians or computer scientists need to use data to train the network. So physics-based models can produce and can provide additional data uh, to train the networks. Uh, and, and, and networks uh, can uh, be extremely useful to, 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 to achieve model reduction. Remember, we, we need to reduce our problem in order to be able to solve it in much shorter time. Uh, we need to estimate parameters. You need to account for variability and uncertainty, uh, which uh, is, uh, I would say, uh, uh, which are overwhelming, especially in application to life sciences. Um, we have already plenty of, uh, say, you have an arsenal of mathematical tools, algorithmical tools, uh, that are there to allow this type of uh, interplay. So we, I believe uh, we have to pursue this type of um, idea and to go toward what we could call, very simply, mathematical fusion. Uh, fusing uh, the three pillars with the fourth pillar, with four new pillars, and, and creating what you see here. This is just one example out of the very many examples that we have today, where you have a new methods that combine full order models. Full order model means those based on, uh, uh, say, on, on the knowledge of fundamental physical principles with networks, uh, networks of different type, of different different type encoder or decoders. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then the creation of reduce order models, thanks to the networks, which will allow to address variability and uncertainty in reasonable time, which is acceptable for our counterpart. Um, so which are directions for MOOCs? Again, this is my very personal, uh, my, my, my very personal uh, um, view. Well, here are a few examples, four instances. And actually, those are the areas that will be covered by uh, uh, our speakers, our mock speakers, uh, this morning and this afternoon. We need to develop mathematics for sustainable infrastructures. And uh, this will be the presentation of uh, Pier Cesare uh, Sustainable uh, development, uh, Luca Formaggia. Uh, neurodegenerative diseases, Paolo Antonietti, who is the youngest, uh, and this talks about neurodegenerative diseases, by the way. Okay, and, 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 and precision healthcare. Uh, by, by Pasquale Charletta. So those are four branches, four areas uh, that uh, could and will, I believe, uh, indeed explore and, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, investigate at MOOCs in the next few years. And I'm talking about the future, not from the past. All, almost all these applications are basically new here. Uh, and uh, this is... Uh, going to be my last picture, so I'd like to thank you for your patience and for being here today. And of course, uh, happy birthday, uh, Max.